And now that Robert has you know met his tobacco needs, um, got his nicotine fix, we're ready to start episode six of Theater School Rejects. Episode six, The Return of the Jedi, or uh, if you're a Latter-day Saint, it's The Book of Mormon. Wait, no. That would be three. We already did that one. So we're somewhere in the, like, perhaps uh, another religion at this point. After saying didn't want to talk about religion or politics, boom, right into religion and politics. Because <laughs> that's, that's how we organized the, <laughs> the pre-talk of the show. Um, so, anyway, this weekend I did a show in, um, in Burbank at Flappers, did a little comedy show. And I, cause I was telling Robert that I got bored kind of after doing the same material, same set for like the last three shows. And it went really, really well. And Robert came to one of those shows. And I'm like, I'm not okay. Like, I get bored really easy. I'm like, I don't want to do this. It's working out. I need to change things because God forbid the same thing happened for two months in a row. So I was like, oh, I have some stuff I haven't done in a while. And I did it. And it turns out there's a good reason I haven't done in a while. And I kind of lost the crowd about three quarters through my set and did not get them back. <laughs> so they, so this is the first time hearing of the specifics. So what's... Um so what was it that, that lost them? Politics, religion, combination of the two? It's too much similar. Like I talk, I, I just talk about um, relationship stuff and my bad luck with it. And it's fine for like one minute, but when it gets into the second or third minute, it's still like funny on its own, but it's too similar to what's come before, I yeah. think. Uh, Doug, by the way, is single, and I think he's far too uh, good looking uh, and far too much of a humanitarian to be so for so long. So, ladies, <laughs> here's, we're looking at you. Well, I, am, I have the good looks of a uh, below average half orc. Like, not a good looking half orc. Like, a half orc that other people are like, man, he could use some plastic surgery. I mean, other half orcs. Hey, man, I've seen slash fic and fanfic about some half orcs and full orcs. I mean, uh, some <laughs> girls dig tusks. You know? And then there's that one, uh, there's that one gay one that I read once that was all about the line in uh, Lord of the Rings: "You will taste man flesh tonight." <laughs> Cue like disco. Uh, <laughs> but speaking of, uh, since the last one got a little heavy with the politics, we we're thinking about talking about something near and dear to our hearts, but completely unimportant: uh, role-playing games, LARPs, and tabletops, and all that good nerdy stuff. Yeah, I've gotten into a LARP. I've gone twice to Vampire the Masquerade in the past, like, two months. Found a really cool group at this uh, at Strategicon, which is a great gaming convention. If you haven't gone to Strategicon, you should go. Uh, it's, like, three times a year, $60 bucks a butt, uh, sixty dollars for the whole for the whole weekend. Worth it. I've, I've, my LARPing experience is uh, one and a half LARPs. And it's funny because I'm an actor. I love I love acting and any, any chance to get some attention, of course. Any, any chance to get a little spotlight. But I think one of the problems for me is, of course, at a LARP, that's everybody. <laughs> Everybody's out there to uh, be their special little s snowflake self and tell you all about their black backstory. But no, wait, they're mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about my character. <laughs> <laughs> and then, that's a great pickup pick up line. <laughs> is a, Let me tell you all about my characters. 20th level, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. Tell me you haven't pulled that off with some girl. Okay, so I've been fortunate enough. Um, you get you get into these cultures, these subcultures. You go to enough cons and just gaming nights. You meet, like, that, you know, that, that unicorn. <laughs> um, that unicorn is actually getting a lot more common now, though. We get a lot more ladies uh, getting involved in the stories because they looked behind all the... Uh, the, the, the junk food and the sodas and the costumes and realized we're just playing make-believe, <laughs> you know? And yeah, well, um, like, so, so what anyway, what are the one and a half LARPs that you say you've done? Uh, there is one in, I think, Yorba Linda. My friend Lindsay um, actually brought me to, I got to play a Toreador. Um, it was actually, um, they said, oh, wait, uh, actor, I love uh, Captain Blood and also the original Robin Hood, 
Um, Errol Flynn? Errol Flynn. So it was basically alluding to, I never confirmed, but the... Uh, the you were the vampire Errol Flynn? Yes, you know, it was uh, around from the glory days of Hollywood, the Brown Derby, and all of that. I was very proud of that character. I liked the, uh, the idea, that, that Toreador from the golden age of Hollywood. Uh, Errol Flynn was the original heartthrob, and I had my ridiculous mustache, so I felt it fit. Uh, what, was, what was your favorite uh, character that you ever played, that you ever created and brought to the game? Oh, um, that's a, thank you. I love that question. Uh, um, <laughs> well, I really had fun, and you were there, um, running for a year. Um, vamp well, I suppose it wasn't a year. It was about three months, running Vampire the Masquerade every Saturday night and then going to Rocky after. Mm -hmm. and it was just for three or four months, just a really solid twisting line, and I got to be all the characters. I got to be a Malkavian prince who saw, like, weasel spirits. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what Malkavian is, listen to, I think, episode two. I covered well, this. We'll, we'll re-reference it. It's vampires who have, as part of their, as part of, by being sired, they either aggravate or increase their, um, their mental deviance. Um, in fact, I had a, the, the best thing I had, like, a Saturday night at the, at the, at this, LARP, this live action role play game in downtown Los Angeles, was I was talking to a Malkavian and a character that the person playing was really into it. And I was saying that she could have been kidnapped. And she goes, I wasn't kidnapped. And I go, How would you know? And she started like mentally spinning and she broke out her tinfoil hat and put it on. And then she was able to calm down. <laughs> That is, that is, there's a lot of fun to be had in LARPs. Unfortunately, the um, biggest problem, of course, is the LARP community. <laughs> but uh, playing back in Long Beach, back in the glory days in the 90s when we used to do Rocky Horror, um, that was a lot of fun. That, it was through those games I, that uh, Doug actually introduced me to uh, Leonard Cohen and uh, Nick Cave and uh, into that. I mean, real... And if you want to do gothy, you want to do, like, real crusty gothic stuff, that's where you want to go. That's music to drink whiskey to. I did not introduce in the cave. I don't know where you're getting that. But uh, if you've seen Pulp Fiction the movie, he would start every of his underground broadcast with Leonard Cohen, uh, Everybody Knows. And and I wouldn't just use that. I would do it Waiting for the Miracle, uh, which was Natural Born Killers. That's oh. what sets the mood in Natural Born Killers, is yes. Waiting for the Miracle to Come. Or one of the mood establishing pieces. Um, Leonard Cohen is great for just that, and I would it would all be candlelight that because you can't you can't role play Vampire the Masquerade in neon. Like it's yeah. got to be a room that allows people to feel like whatever you want to do. You just but you can set a mood. I think even D and D would be benefit by candlelight. You want to like let people pretend, not be stuck on the mechanics. Um, we have two friends. Um, I'll give them fake names. Um, We'll call one Stan and one Laurel, and um, they are really, really good at number crunching. Like as far as D and D, they can max out their characters and break the game, mm. but they never are anybody else. Well, in, in, not only the time, but they but they have a tendency to get into a game and focus on breaking the mechanics rather than role playing. Yeah. Well. I actually, I've, I've seen some progress in that department recently. Um, you talk about one of the people I game with on the regular, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, he's, uh, he's gotten really into the scope of the fantasy. And that's, that's the other thing I wanted to touch on is what we do this for. I remember Doug describing these characters as one guy who's, you know, doesn't, you know, you don't bring a knife to a fist fight, kind of. It's talking about his morality. And setting that, and that's why I keep thinking you introduced me to uh, Nick Cave is because you've set that mood so well, that just is red right hand, and uh, that feeling, the, the feeling like you're living film noir. It was really good at setting the mood. And you may Doug, you don't see a theatrical guy, you know, <laughs> not generally, but uh, it just had a beautiful sense for the theme, um, which led me to go on and tell other stories. I even did those chats, the uh, online chat games that people took too seriously. Uh, and practically lived another life via chat room for a while. Well, you had a really good mage game that, like, Neil and, and everybody else, like, really got into. That's kind of how I ran into it when, uh, when I was crashing with you at that time, and then and they would come over and just do, like, these deep, you know, mage games. Well, mage really lent itself well to this, like, 
getting in, you know, getting sidetracked by philosophy too, and things like that. Just the nature of reality. What would you do if you could just alter reality at its core? Things like that. And uh, and it's funny because we used to do this all these white wolf, very acting, character intensive. Uh, I still try to bring that there, but lately I've been all Pathfinder, which for those of you unfamiliar is more like Dungeons and Dragons. So uh, called uh, Dungeons uh, and uh, 3.75 because it was before. Fourth edition ruined everything. And then fifth edition is a kind of better, solid. I'm not in love with it. I actually prefer Pathfinder, but I can see why people prefer fifth. Um, um, I haven't played Pathfinder, but I've read about three fourths of the Pathfinder tales, which are like novels set in the Pathfinder universe. Because one of my favorite authors, Tim Pratt, um, wrote an alchemist character and wrote another character who's like a warrior with a talking sword. <laughs> but they're, they're not so much warriors as con men. <laughs> the sword's really enchanted. Like it's a, it's got like it absorbed kind of the mentality of a, of a white dragon, and it's all about hoarding gold. So, which is a good attitude for a con man to have. Yes. Um, the books are called Liar's Island, Liar's Bargain, and Liar's Blade, and they're all by Tim Pratt, all set in the Pathfinder universe. Um, I can't recommend them highly enough. <clears throat> if you're, if you, if you don't have a D and D game to play with, but you want to like take, get that fix. <laughs> That's, uh, I honestly haven't actually looked too much at the setting of Pathfinder because we always put our own homebrew stuff into it. Um, but, you know, I, from what I've seen, it's gotten, it's really advanced the traditional setting of, of Dungeons and Dragons from the, you know, swords and crossbows being cu cutting edge tech uh, to in, now we're doing a lot of, a lot of piratey stuff, you know. Yeah, yeah, the, and, um, very in vogue. <laughs> I found it's a, a, it's a wide enough universe that like there's a there's like a duelist class, or at least there are in the books. Like they get like their guns from another dimension, or they're made by mages, but they're like single shot pistols. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I believe it's a Laurel. <laughs> uh, in your in your example, the pseudonym Laurel, I think applies. Um, but uh, hates hates guns in his D and D, uh, and I love the image of a of a magic uh, gunslinger. Uh, you know, I love the character of Doc, Doc Holliday in Tombstone, and I love the idea of, you know, taking that personality and that flair and putting it in other things, seeing how it, seeing how it takes, and uh, he hates the idea of any kind, especially when you, uh, the way the rules go, you end up re reloading your weapon multiple times a minute, and he's just, that's where it kills it for him. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I don't want like nine millimeter re repeater auto weapons, but if you know, in D and D, a one shot gun that you can reload like a rifle is not more powerful than a lightning bolt. <laughs> it's not like oh my god, if you can kill a distance, it kills the game. Well, okay, because that wasn't happening already. <laughs> That's true. Although I've been playing, and they're already, I mean, it's already extant the idea of these uh, uh, wizards, just incredibly high intelligence characters, with uh, uh, a penchant. For, uh, <laughs> nicely, nicely phrased. That's actually a valid pronunciation of pension. That's, that's <laughs> completely valid. Thank uh, you. It's British, because uh, well, it, I guess it's French by way of British, but penchant. Yes. Yeah, I think of it whenever I uh, uh, acquire my accoutrement. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so wizards with a penchant for uh, gears, clockwork, and engineering, um, and you know, it's like these. So if they have magically enhanced intelligence and ridiculously long lifespans, they're constantly learning. They're gonna come up with a revolver's not so mythically complex that this wizard whose intelligence is, you know, ten times that of your average man would might stumble upon it. And I've played that wizard, and the, the game master at that point hated it. <laughs> well, yeah, and I'd hate it too. I mean, like, because things can, well, there's also things that can work, but can break the game, which is like, what? I prefer like, the amber theory of role playing, which is like the idea of a diceless game, which requires everybody to buy in. Everybody has to be like, my, 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 I don't, I don't mean I don't want strategy. Strategy is great. Tell me about what's good about your character and use what your skills are, leverage against someone else's weakness. And then you're not gonna win every time, but you'll win the majority of the time. And when you put your strength against someone else's strength and if they're roughly compar comparable, you're gonna lose a couple times out of five. And if the other person's strength is stronger than you, you're gonna lose about four times out of five. And, you know, 
that's what new characters are for. <laughs> I actually played the, uh, at the, the Amber game once um, after reading the series, getting into the series, um, which is a great concept. I think, although the concept's been done better, uh, it's, you know, but I mean, I think, I think it's like, been done better, but he did it first. Right. Roger Lasney wrote in the 70s. Uh, and if it's better after Roger Lasney, is not saying it's not better, but it's easier to do better when you have a blueprint of what's been done. <laughs> true, true. Uh, credit where it's due. Um, but yeah, I, I remember playing that game, and it was uh, the, the storyteller was. I don't know if that's the title. Every game has a different title for the person. We'll just use storyteller for the guy yeah. writing the game. But uh, I mean, it was all right. It was good. I I got really creative, um, and I loved. And I, I mean, I am all about the story. Drawing the characters and imagining their backstories, their catchphrases. I really should write, but I'm lazy. Uh. Put in the comments that Robert should write. But he, hey, we're getting him to do comedy. He's coming out on November 22nd, and he's never done comedy before. Okay. And he's actually putting himself out there on stage for probably the first time in like 20 years. That is true. It's my very first time doing stand up comedy. Uh, and November twenty second at Flappers. I he does he does wrangle people for this juggler um, who I hate, <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know he does do that. And yeah, Thomas, that's right. I hate you. We, we can fight anytime you want. Call me. Um, I don't care. I'm forty three. I'll fight anybody who wants to fight. I'm there. Um, so anyway, he does and he does MC. But I think there's a big difference between MC and introducing somebody and wrangling for them and being the performer, even if it's only for four minutes. So I'm all excited about Robert getting up on stage and doing his four minutes. It'll be the longest four minutes of my life, and probably yours too. Come see it. <laughs> and on that positive note, no, okay, but I'm not gonna let you stop the self depreciation. Are you excited about this? I'm super excited. I've been doing a lot of thinking about like what material I might do. I'm excited because I'm having a party right before it, and I'm hoping I can get a bunch of those people to show up and pack the house. Um, I don't want to guilt people, but if less than eight people show up, I owe Flappers Comedy Club $200. <laughs> uh, do you want to come out and show us some support? Also, uh, Doug will be, is that your directorial debut? Uh, first time directing, first time producing. Is directing a very funny play. We've been reading, before we record here, we do uh, scenes from uh, Joshua Schneider's uh, Spear Carriers. And we'll be putting those up as part of our episodes at some point. Oh crap, okay, I didn't. <laughs> oh, Robert didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I really love reading through the scripts. So, uh, anytime you like enjoy reading the script without seeing somebody perform, you know it's, it's some good material. All right, so uh, again, this is Doug X. You can find me at Love is Cthulhu and- This is Robert Kyle, who's uh, at typo, nevermind. All right. On the Twitters. 